Magandang umaga. Good morning to one and all. And I'm happy to see you online. Um, we have about 188. Uh, we have 188 participants uh, this morning. And without much ado, I'd like uh, to introduce our lecturer this morning. Our lecturer, Pia Tendidero, is a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, Linguistics at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Um, she teaches English language courses to accounting students in the University of Santo Tomas, Manila. But before joining the academe, she worked in corporate communication as uh, editor, writer, and trainer for Sisip Boris Velayo and Company, one of the biggest accounting firms in the Philippines. And drawing from her experience of working with accounting students and professionals, she has published on language use and communication in business and accounting. And her PhD project extends this research to globalize accounting practice, including offshore accounting work. And she has a Twitter account and she tweets as uh, uh, at Pia Tenedero. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce to you a good friend, a colleague, and a very good person, Pia Tenedero. Maraming salamat, Andrew. Just checking if everybody can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Maraming salamat sa Linguistic Society of the Philippines at ganun din sa DLSU leader for organizing this event. Um, special thanks to Andrew for extending the invitation to me and for patiently bearing with me. Um, I want to congratulate you in advance because I find that the response to this event is overwhelmingly positive. I was under the impression that 100 lang tayo today, but when you said 188, I was, that was, that's just really mind blowing. Uh, thankfully, the technology is working because if it didn't, that would be really funny because we're going to talk about um, technology also as part of our discussion today. Anyway, um, so I, as I said, Andrew was very patient with me because in May, he already invited me to share with you part of my thesis in an LSP web event like this. Um, and I was so excited to do it right away, but as a PhD candidate, alam niyo po, PhD also means patiently hoping for a degree. And that's what I am, patiently hoping for a degree. Um, I have to prudently seek my supervisor's guidance on everything that I do related to my thesis, including uh, what to present, where, and when to do that. Um, but thankfully, my supervisors, distinguished professor Ingrid Piller and Dr. Loy Lee Singh, who are very brilliant, they're just really brilliant supervisors and super supportive. Um, they gave the go signal for me to share with you today part of my findings that I believe everyone can relate to in these unique times. So if you will allow me, I will begin sharing my screen now. Oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. All right, so... In the next 30 minutes or so, I will be sharing with you lessons about working from home, a sociolinguistic analysis of the globalized accountant experience. So in this presentation, I will give a brief background first about my study, and then I will segue into the main feature, which is the three lessons about working remotely that we can all learn from offshore, including home-based accountants. So first, please allow me to tell you a little bit about my study. My thesis looks into the communication practices and ideologies in accounting education and globalized accounting work in the Philippines. So why accounting? Because it is a global priority skilled occupation, especially in global North countries like Australia, US and Canada. So what that means is there are a lot of jobs for accountants. And of course, that makes accountancy an attractive degree option. But my personal interest in, in this field, as Andrew has mentioned in reading my bio note, is linked to my involvement in accounting education and accounting work. Um, so, hindi man po ako accountant, I have a personal and professional interest, really, more professional interest in accounting education and accounting work. 
Now, why the Philippines? Because our country is one of the most active labor brokerage states, exporting workers to different parts of the world since the 1970s. But recently, our country has been gaining ground as an emerging global leader in knowledge process outsourcing, or KPO. Naririnig nyo na po siguro itong KPO. Basically, what it is is a relocation of higher end or core business functions from one country to another. So, ito po yung context ng globalized accounting. So, when I say globalized accounting, this is the practice of professional accounting to support global businesses, some of which may be headquartered in the Philippines, like in Makati or BGC, or overseas, like in Sydney or Toronto, for example. I'm doing a sociolinguistic study through ethnography. Sociolinguistic means it's a qualitative, descriptive study of how communication practices shape and are shaped in context by social agents. So I'm not trying to prove any hypothesis. I'm not trying to fix the system or the structures in place. My goal is simply to describe and critically analyze using sociolinguistic lenses, communication in action as evidenced by ethnographic data. So ethnography means I went up close and on the ground to observe accounting teachers, students, and practitioners as they interact in real time and space. I collected multiple data types to embed myself in the phenomenon as much as the participants allowed me, of course, so that I can begin to understand how they communicate and why they communicate the way they do. So during a four month field work in Metro Manila from June to September, 2018, I accessed two sets of research sites. I went to two top performing accounting schools and multiple workplaces of globalized accountants. And with the help of two administrators, eight teachers, nine students and 18 accountants, I was able to gather qualitative data in the form of curricular documents, observation, observation field notes, of course, interviews, online job ads, communication activity logs, and sample work. Using critical discourse analysis, I examine how communication is discursively constructed in text and enacted in interaction. So I follow Fair Klaus CDA approach to examine the dialectical relationship between textual discourse and social practices in the classroom. Um, with God's help, I'm currently in the last leg of the PhD program, and I had a completely different idea of how this final year would run. So as Andrew has reminded us and described for us in his talk last May 8 on ELT COVID-19 and ECQ, of course, we've heard this said many times, the pandemic, this pandemic, which is still upon us, God have mercy on us, is truly unanticipated and unprecedented. So, of course, in this scenario, our usual work becomes quite unusual. Anyone else here today who's trying to finish their PhD in this time of pandemic, I believe, will agree with me that the lockdown setup is quite restricting, but at the same time, it opens up new and interesting opportunities. For example, I'm really grateful that I was granted by Macquarie University the opportunity to present at the Georgetown University Roundtable, or GERT 2020, supposedly in Washington, D.C. in early March this year. Alam niyo po, I was really looking forward to that research trip. But a week before my flight, Macquarie University issued an international travel ban. And so, as you can imagine, my heart really broke for my broken plans but there was no point in fighting it. But thankfully, my supervisors, distinguished Professor Ingrid Piller and Dr. Loy Leasing, I believe Ma'am Loy is with us here today. Hi, Ma'am. Um, they advised me um, not to let it go to waste and to still present virtually. So I did that because I already prepared, so I might as well still share it. So I did it first on Language on the Move. Language on the Move, by the way, is a peer-reviewed sociolinguistics research site that features research on intercultural communication, language learning, multilingualism, and such. And it, um, these studies are featured in blog entry form, so it's more accessible to read. So I strongly encourage you to check out the website. And maybe you can start by checking out the link to my presentation, um, which is uploaded there, and you're welcome to join the discussion. So that was one opportunity for me. And then another opportunity came when the organizers of GERT 
also put together what they call GERT Virtual 2020. So that's a private Facebook group for the presenters in the conference to still share their research through live or video recorded presentations. So these are new opportunities. And I realized even if I missed the opportunity to actually meet and greet international linguists in the flesh, something I was really excited about, um, it wasn't all lost, you know, number one, I was able to reach a much wider audience through these vir virtual platforms. Um, even my parents were able to watch my presentation. And of course, my mom was very happy about that. And secondly, I learned that there are other ways to network with other researchers, and that is through social media. So that's why, as Andrew mentioned, I'm now on Twitter, and mostly I tweet as a researcher. So these are examples of new doors. Now, Another new door that we were all forced to enter at this time is the home-based work setup, also known as working remotely or working from home. Now, let me ask you, how has this way of working worked for you? Does it work? Maybe you have seen memes like these. Now, they speak to the different ways that different people imagine or construct this working environment. Maybe some of you can relate to them as a work from home mom or work from home dad, for example. I personally find them interesting, even amusing, because I believe they capture the multiplicity of views about what it means to work from home. One of my participants who owns a company that offers virtual accounting services said, the trend of the future is working from home. The big question is, are Filipinos ready for this kind of work? I believe this is a question for all of us. Now, while working from home may look different for every person, I believe we can all learn something from the experience of offshore, including home-based accountants, because these are people for whom working remotely is old normal. So if you will allow me, here are three lessons about working remotely that we can all learn from globalized accountants. Lesson number one. Absence of co-location heightens the value of technology. One of the characteristics of globalized accounting work is geographical dispersion. So this is especially obvious in offshore accounting work, which involves relocating finance and accounting services of a company from the headquarters in a home country like, for example, Australia, to a foreign location like the Philippines. So in this kind of work context where workers are not in the same location, so we say they are not co-located, offshore accountants constantly work in virtual teams. Online job ads for these kinds of positions specify technology as part of the requirements for the job. So in this recruitment text, employers identify specific hardware capacities such as high internet speed and computer processor and the ability to use accounting software, computer technologies, communication technologies, and messaging applications as part of the hiring criteria. Some companies even require applicants for home-based positions to have their own device. This is also called as bring your own device or BYOD. Now, this practice potentially facilitates the creation of virtual workspaces that enable the organization members to collaborate even as they operate remotely. So this is how technology is constructed in job ads as the material reality that connects globally dispersed workers. Now, how does this material reality actually work for virtual teams? Let's look at the experience of offshore accountant Fatima. Fatima works for an international KPO service company providing accounting services overseas. Now she works from her residence in Manila. She says her daily work involves waiting for her teammates in London and the US to send her data on the trades for the day. And when the numbers arrive, she reviews them from her home office in Manila and reconciles them if there are any discrepancies. And if there are any issues, she coordinates with the information and technology team in India so that she can send the reports back to her teammates in London and the US for reporting to clients by the end of day. 
So we see in this example that communication in a spatially and functionally fragmented work context is highly technology dependent. This heightened dependency on technology in this context shapes the way accountants communicate and how they view communication at work. Lesson number two, the virtual environment brings communication skills in sharper focus. So this heightened focus on communication skills begins in the recruitment stage. Job ads talk about digital ways of demonstrating and evaluating communication skills. So for example, offshore job ads tell applicants to make a video clip that tell us a little bit about yourself. They are told to include their Skype ID, the link to their resume, their Facebook or LinkedIn profile, and some adverts also require that applicants complete mandatory online job tests, including standardized English tests and personality profile. The digitization of the recruitment process, as we see here, illustrates how technology alters practices. Edima and Wudak argue that recontextualization involves shifts in meaning and materiality away from their previous instantiations. So in this case, the recontextualization or the shift in context from physical to virtual ways of performing competence causes a heightened valuing or an increase in the valuing of skills tied to specific forms of technology. So here we see that the accountant's ability to communicate digitally is positioned front and center and it is constructed as a very important criteria for hiring. Now, another way to look at this, uh, this practice is to use the sociolinguistic lenses of performance and specifically uh, the lenses offered by um, Goffman and Penny Cook. Um, Irving Goffman, in his very interesting book, this is The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, I strongly recommend this reading, um, he talks about communication practices in work situations as a type of performance. So the way we communicate at work, performance daw po ito. And it is linked to our desire to control the way that people see us, that other people in the workplace see us. So in other words, Goffman is talking about communication practices as performance linked to impression management. Now, while Goffman is focused on impression management, another person um, by the name of Alastair Penny Cook talks about performativity or performance that is public practices um, in communication and language use as linked to identity formation. So this is another way to look at it, that our language use or communication practices are an act of identity. So for example, maybe you can say that what I'm doing right now, sharing my research, this communication practices is a performance of my identity as a researcher or an academic. So looking and using these two lenses of performance as impression management and as identity formation, I argue that the virtual work environment now is a kind of stage that is set up by employers. And on this digital stage, accountants are required to perform their competence and identity as employable digital workers by embodying generic communication skills in disembodied ways. By generic communication skills, I mean writing and speaking. Um, I say they're generic because anyone who has had some form of education, especially higher education, can of course write and speak, so they're generic in that sense. And when we say disembodied, that means that um, because of the mediation of technology, the physical processes that typically accompany the performance of writing and speaking skills are removed and altered because of technologization. So specifically, accountants perform their writing skills through digital cover letters and online tests, and they demonstrate their speaking skills through Skype interviews. But what are the implications of these practices? So for one, technology-mediated communication instead of face-to-face -face modality requires that both the applicant and the recruiter or the employer are technologically savvy. So this presumes, for example, that they know how to make eye contact by looking at the web camera through the computer camera, for example, and not by looking at the image of the other person on the screen. So this is how we do digital eye contact, right? 
So um, not being able to perform this knowledge, for example, in the virtual platform may negatively impact the interviewer's impression of the candidate and potentially affect recruitment decisions. So in other words, there is an embedded expectation that accountants already know how to communicate well using these digital platforms. But what actually counts as good digital communication in the view of employers is not very clear, it's ambiguous. And this is illustrated in the case of offshore accountant Hilda, who recounted her experience of failing the online interview on her first try. Um, I will read the original transcript, but the translation in English, um, they're provided in brackets. So, sabi ni Hilda, it's because of my speaking. Yeah, kasi yung nag interview actually is virtual. Hindi namin siya kilala, hindi namin siya nakikita. So, we're thinking that he, she is just assessing us by the way you speak, not by our knowledge. Accountant Hilda describes the virtual interview as a depersonalized modality. She suspects that this disembodied job search strategy devalued her work-relevant knowledge and instead highlighted her speaking skills, which she identified as one of her weaknesses. So in other words, the digital stage heightened the focus on her communication ability. And in the case of Hilda, what she believes to be her inadequate fluency, yun tulo yung na-emphasize at the expense of a focus on her technical knowledge as an accountant. But here's a twist. Despite failing this virtual job interview, she reported being notified later that she was reconsidered for the job. So, natanggap din si Hilda sa trabaho. In my view, the reversal of this hiring decision suggests that while the ability to communicate technologically is emphasized as a criterion for offshore positions, what counts as good communication in virtual environment, how it is validated or evaluated by gatekeepers, and how much impact it really has on the hiring criterion or the hiring decision are not clear. They're all ambiguous. So in other words, digital communication skill is constructed as an important yet ambiguous hiring criterion. What is only clear to us is that to be employed, globalized accountants are required to step on a digital stage, a virtual platform where to perform their communication skills, which may be potentially treated as a proxy um, for their technical knowledge and competence as accounting practitioners. So in a work context like this, where accountants need to work in virtual teams, the hiring decision initially hinges upon their ability to demonstrate their digital communication skills more than their digital accounting skills. Now, the sharper focus on account, offshore accountants' digital communication skills is confirmed by the view of an employer. Boss Tita said, because clients cannot see us, one sense that is sight is missing. So another sense should compensate. That is the sense of verbal communication. If this is impaired, it's not going to freaking work. And you can tell from those last two words that um, Boss Tita feels very strongly about the importance of the verbal ability of her accountants. Well, actually, the context of this excerpt is she was really expressing her concern or really complaining about what she believes to be the limited competence of her virtual accountants when it comes to digital communication. Now, this view reflects how visual absence or not being able to see coworkers or clients face to face highlights accountants verbal presence or their verbal skills. Now, as mentioned earlier, this means that features of their verbal expression, including their fluency and maybe even their accent, they become more emphasized. And this puts extra pressure on accountants, especially when they are told by their employers, uh, your communication skills are impaired or it's not going to freaking work. You know, these kinds of discourses, we call them the perennial deficit discourse, which is always emphasizing the gap, always saying, Basically, the message is no matter what you do, your communication skills will never be enough. And that kind of message, along with the ambiguity of what it is anyway, what does it mean anyway to be a good digital communicator um, and the increasing demand, you know, they're repeatedly told you have to be a good communicator, but then they're not told what it means to be a good communicator. 
and then they're repeatedly told that you're not, you're not a good communicator. So we see how this is a very difficult position for globalized accountants. Um, of course, they may have an idea of what it means to be a good communicator, but this is a very slippery and it's constantly shifting because their idea may be different from their employer's idea. So we see here that this can exacerbate accountants' verbal and linguistic insecurities. So this is one of the challenges of working in a virtual environment. Now, the notion of not seeing or the sense of sight as missing mentioned in this excerpt points to limited visibility or transparency in the remote work environment. And this brings us to the third lesson. Lesson number three. Remote workers' productivity and efficiency are under close surveillance online. So the notion of not seeing or limited transparency has implications on the impressions of productivity and efficiency or what supervisors and clients imagine accountants are doing when they are working from home. This issue is concretely described by offshore accountant Corina. So in describing her offshore work, she said, the difference now, I think, is the language barrier. It is more difficult because there's no direct contact. And then they, client, are not seeing what you are doing, but I know in myself that I am really working eight hours and sometimes render overtime if needed. The absence of co-location or the lack of direct physical contact is described here by Karina as a barrier, which makes work interactions more difficult. So the absence of face-to-face -face interaction in offshore work emphasizes the spatial fragmentation and the lack of visibility among team members and clients. So the fact that co-workers and clients cannot see or cannot monitor each other as they work, they work remotely is seen as engendering doubt and suspicion on whether accountants are in fact using work hours to do actual work. <clears throat> So this view captures the reality that the physical barrier creates issues of trust, which may be easier to manage if we are interacting with warm bodies in the same space than if we're just interacting with talking heads, you know, on the screen or in our ear. So these notions of transparency and accountability are hallmarks of audit. Now, audit is a concept that originated in the financial and accounting field in the early 1980s to address the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of publicly funded activities. But from its mother domain, that is accounting, the concept of audit has been extended to other domains, including higher education, um, which takes the form of practices like accreditation. But despite this extension, Audit has retained the sense of principles and practices of scrutiny, examination, and passing of judgment that operate on a relationship of power between scrutinizer and observed. So in other words, audit assumes a position of low trust. So low trust and critical skepticism, these tend to be the posture of social agents who cannot interact face to face and who often do not have a shared cultural context, including not having the same first language. So we see um, trust is a big word, or it's a very important issue in the context of virtual work environments. The interrogation of trust in this context, in turn, provides a pretext or a reason for the imposition of new norms of conduct and professional behavior that I argue are aimed at putting remote workers under close surveillance. So one of the ways that employers keep a close tab on remotely working accountants is by giving them access to this menu of internet-based spoken and written channels, which they can use to communicate with other social agents at work. And these channels, of course, offer variable advantages and disadvantages, and the accountants have to take these pros and cons into account in deciding which channels to use to get their job done on time. Spoken channels are reportedly valued for synchronous communication, which enables immediate feedback, including verbal and nonverbal feedback. So nonverbal feedback includes facial expression and tone. And therefore, they say that this facilitates faster exchange of information and decision making or resolutions. Also, features of 
um, video conferencing sites like Skype and Zoom also offer multimodal channels so that in addition to exchanging voice messages, interactants are also able to share videos, written chat messages, and share screens like what we're doing right now. So this immediacy of feedback, nonverbal cues, and multimodal channels approximate the face-to-face -face interaction so that accountants believe that spoken channels provide them a stronger sense of connectedness and rapport. Now, this sense of connectedness is particularly highlighted by offshore accountants who described doing um, virtual team huddles with their teammates overseas or wherever else they're located. So basically these are video calls that they do on a regular basis with their teammates. And they believe that this practice helps them cope with the isolation and loneliness, that sense of isolation that comes with uh, working remotely over an extended period of time. Now the disadvantages of digital spoken channels include the pressure to respond right away. So as a result, some accountants confessed saying yes when they were asked if they understood the instructions that were given to them by the client or their supervisors via audio or video call, even if in fact they did not understand the instructions. Um, so of course, there are very important, very critical implications to work outcomes with this kind of misrepresentation of understanding, but they reported managing it by consulting more approachable members of the team after the call. You know, um, this reminds me of something that happens very commonly in our classrooms, I think, you know, like the teacher says, gives instruction to the students and says, oh, does everybody understand? And all the students say, yes. And then they turn to each other and say, anu dao? You know, so something like that, accountants do something similar. And a specific difficulty that they repeatedly mention is understanding the accent of other speakers of English. So two accountants said that the way they manage this is by asking the person with the quote difficult accent to just email them or to just send them uh, an online message. So shifting from spoken to written channels is a strategy to ensure that information is accurately exchanged. So besides allowing the exchange of accurate and also detailed information, another attraction of digital written channels is asynchronous communication. So which means accountants can respond in their own time. So there's less pressure to respond to an email right away, for example. So they can take their time to read and understand the message. They can even get help from their coworkers or their supervisors, or they can even use templates in order to produce more polished, or more precise responses. Now, written channels also provide an instant record of the communication, which is important for tasks that require proper documentation. For example, submission of completed work that needs to have proof, right? And also uh, agreements done orally. Now, a limitation of digital written channels is related to it's being a form of asynchronous communication. You see, flexibility of response time could also mean delays, possibly due to time zone difference, which is another challenge in offshore work, or it could also be due to non-responsiveness of addressees, which can be interpreted as negative efficiency or inefficiency. And this, we find, is penalized through other virtual communication practices, which I will discuss next. So accountants say that for very urgent jobs that require high efficiency, the strategy that works best for them is to combine these spoken and written channels. So for example, if they really want the other person to um, respond right away, they will send an email and then they will send an online chat message in the office messenger and then they will call that person. So that person has absolutely no excuse for not responding right away. Now, what if the other person still does not respond? Another form of surveillance is the practice of penalizing that kind of uh, practice or behavior, not being responsive right away, or which is considered inefficiency and is of course frowned upon in a corporate work context. Um, accountants talk about two practices, chasing and escalating. So let's look at chasing first. Accountant Alma describes it for us as, and again, please allow me to read the original transcript. 
Pag offshore kasi, lalo ganito, naka-work from home, tapos ang kailangan mo is yung boss mo na nasa ibang location, kung hindi sila responsive sa chat, para kasing hindi mo alam kung anong nangyayari sa kanila dun eh. Hindi naman nila madala sabihin na, oh, meron muna kaming party, or meron muna akong meeting, hindi naman ganun. So yun, minsan, yung pag-chase, like kung nababasa ba niya, or sobrang busy ba niya. So chasing here is described as the virtual act of running after someone who appears to be evading an initiated communication. Another practice is called escalating. Here's Accountant Fatima's description of it. Depende kasi sa issue. Kapag if it's very critical that it needs to be resolved within the day, kapag one hour, hindi ka pa pinapansin, you escalate it in the first level. So i-email mo yung taong ayaw gumalaw. Um, tapos, isisi mo yung boss niya at saka boss mo. Pag ayaw pa rin niyang gumalaw, you call the boss of that person and then sabihin mo na ganito, ganyan. Yung second level, yung boss ng boss niya ang nakasisi na. Tapos, yung third level escalation, yun na. Mag-email na yung boss mo sa boss niya. Yan. So, escalating here is described as the virtual act of reporting a project issue due to a team member's inaction to higher position social agents in the workplace structure. Um, in Filipino, this is the equivalent of sumbong. And while we culturally frown on this practice, it is actually encouraged, even applauded, according to Fatima, in globalized accounting workplaces where efficiency and productivity are priority even sometimes at the expense of co-workers face. So these negative reports, of course, have potential negative implications on the performance evaluation of the team member who is constructed as unproductively engaged during work hours, as in having a party or intentionally not wanting to move, which are depictions of inefficiency. So with these practices, we see that co-workers orient toward each other in a competitive way, which potentially makes rapport building even more challenging than it already is in a non-face-to-face -face environment. The final example of online surveillance creates an impression of addressing the concern of spatial dispersion and limited transparency. Offshore accountants reported using cloud-based workflow or project management applications that document or provide a way for virtual team members to document their work productivity on a daily basis. An example of this is Basecamp. Now, Basecamp is self-described in its website as designed for virtual workers to see plus manage everything even though they're apart. And there are other forms of uh, workflow management um, applications like Jira and Carbon and such. And different workflow applications have different features, but they generally offer productivity tracking tools that give employers the ability to monitor each remote worker's activities for each work day. So this is an example of what Luke Savage calls a mini big brother that monitors their habits and activities down to the last keystroke. In other words, it's a means to control accountants, to push them to demonstrate and communicate their productivity, to prove that they're really doing their job during work hours and not abusing the freedom of working in their own private space. This final lesson points to the tension between autonomy and accountability. So on one hand, working from home is defined by some measure of autonomy or increased personal freedom and work-life flexibility. This is especially one of the attractions of working from home, according to accountants who are working mothers. But this imagined benefit is erased by institutionalized measures that impose more controls over workers' use of their time. Savasha simply describes this situation. He says, under a new regime of remote work, Measures like these could fast become the new norm, with every person's laptop transformed into a telescreen through which the panoptic gaze of their employers can peer at any time. With the final traces of human warmth and casual social interaction stripped in the name of market efficiency, relations between employees could also be radically depersonalized. So in sum, here are the three lessons from accountants about working remotely. 
Number one, absence of collocation heightens the value of technology. So if the rest of the team and the clients are in different locations, technology provides a way to manage that spatial fragmentation. Number two, the virtual environment brings communication skills into sharper focus. So on the digital stage, communication skills are placed front and center so that it tends to be given more value, sometimes even more than tech technical competence. So this increased valuing of communication skills is linked to the absence of the sense of sight or not being able to see the other team members, which engenders that sense of um, suspicion and doubt or low trust on whether they are in fact working even if they are at home. And number three, remote workers' productivity and efficiency are under close surveillance online. So digital channels, chasing and escalating, cloud-based project management software are examples of these surveillance tools that compel accountants to communicate or to perform transparency, accountability, and efficiency online. So using the lenses of audit, um, these practices may be viewed as controls that are set up in order to remind accountants that they are under constant surveillance so that they will not be too at home while working at home. Um, and this, in effect, has the impact of creating some sense of insecurity. And that sense of insecurity stems broadly from being made aware that it's not enough to be good in their technical skills as accountants. Because the idealized globalized accountant, as we've, we've seen represented in the ethnographic data, are expected to also use technology and not just use, sometimes even mimic the automated productivity and efficiency of technology to create positive impressions of trust. And so here we see the tension between autonomy and accountability. So those are the three lessons that we can take home for today. And it is my hope that these findings invite you to reflect on your own experience of working with digital communication technologies. As for now, most of us still continue to work from home. Um, but I also hope that we can all sooner go back to our physical offices. Thank you very much for your time. Salamat po sa inyong pakikinig. So um, I think I will give the floor back to Andrew or Dr. Shirley. What is happening now? <laughs> oh, I see my supervisor, Dr. Loy Leasing is in the house. Hi, Mom Loy. So I don't know what's happening. Oh, I think this is the part for the Q&A. So if there are any questions, I think that uh, Andrew, I remember Andrew saying that the way it's done now is you just type your question in the chat and then I can read it and then I'll do my best to address it for you. So this is us using the um, software. Hello, Pia, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Shirley, nice to hear your beautiful voice. I'm trying to figure out there must be something wrong with my audio, okay, since the start. That's why I asked Andrew to introduce you. I'm so sorry about that one, okay? No worries. No worries. Thank you very much, Pia. I stayed the whole time. You are so brilliant, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Glory to God. For LSP and uh, the LSU leader, okay? I'd like to acknowledge Lloyd Lee Singh. She's here with us. Uh, I saw uh, Dean Maluma Duño also a while ago. Oh, of course. Yeah, my mentors. Hi, Mama Lou. Of course, Camille is also here and the rest. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was really brilliant, Pia. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I cannot uh, show my, my video. I am having so very bad sinusitis for this oh, morning. No. Oh, no. So let's uh, have the, the usual Q&A. Okay. Looks like everyone else was listening to you attentively. They were not able to uh, type in their questions, but we can do it. Um, like live okay so you can just raise your hand if you have any questions then i'll just uh, unmute your mic so that's how we'll go about okay anyone would like to uh, raise a hand okay 
well as you know your your topic is a specialized uh field okay loy is raising um, a hand so i'm going to unmute that one okay go ahead Loy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And uh, my apologies, Pia, for being late because I had an issue um, signing in. I actually don't have a question. Um, I support Pia's presentation, but I just wanted to raise my hand so I can be unmuted. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to Link, um, LSP and the LSU leader and to USD, of course, um, uh, for this opportunity for Pia. Um, and um, I look forward to your questions to her as well. And um, I'll jump in. Uh, she's asked me to jump in if I can, but I'm, I'm sure uh, she has it all covered. But it's lovely to, to see everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Shirley and Andrew. Uh -huh. Thank you, Loy. Thank you, Ma'am Loy. Yeah. You see, that is how supportive her, my supervisor is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of asking this one, okay, probably due to some ignorance in the field of accountancy. But Pia, in your personal uh, assessment, where's the like accountancy field uh, um, going in the Philippines? Okay, I, I've heard you come from the SGV. Okay, mm. Just in your presentation, you, you, you were talking all about this digitization of the accountancy as a field and so on and so on. But in the Philippines, is that happening now? Or would you know? Uh, thank like you. The, the um, interview and everything done uh, through internet. Okay, I'm not, I'm not aware. That's why I said uh, probably due to my ignorance of the field. Okay, I can only speak of my uh, work, which is all about teaching. Yes, of course. That's a very important question. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Um, in fact, so uh, everything that I presented today, it's in the context of globalized accounting practice in the Philippines. So yes, in terms of the use of technology that I've, I've mentioned in my presentation, all of that is happening already. And mostly, of course, affecting offshore accountants. So on offshore accountants, these are uh, Filipino accountants, they're based in the Philippines, but they are providing accounting services to clients based overseas. So that is why technology plays a very big part in that kind of work context. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in, in, the, in the Philippines, like it's not, that it doesn't have to be offshore, yung locally lang. Uh, um, they're still engaging in face-to-face -face, uh, a modality or yeah. into like 100% uh, digital platform. All right. So yung mga, I think Dr. Shirley is talking about onshore accountants. So yung onshore, yun po yung kanilang mga clients ay naka-based din sa Philippines. Okay. So for those kinds of, of cohort, for that kind of cohort, um, they're, they're, mostly their interactions will also involve face-to-face -face po. except I guess um, one of the things that I appreciate about the, the new opportunity that this topic allowed me at this time is everybody onshore and offshore at this moment um, will have to do it online, so virtual po, even onshore. So just at this particular moment, um, even onshore accountants have to use technology to keep in touch with their clients and their teammates. But of course, when I gathered my data during that time, it, it's not as emphasized as in the experience of offshore accountants. Okay, very clear. Thank you for elucidating that one P, yes. Okay. Yes, no worries. Uh, yes, uh, any other questions? Okay. I'm, 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 okay. So at this point, Pia, oh yeah, Ven, Venmar Kudong, okay? Venmar, you are already um, muted. Go. Hello po. Yes. Good morning po. Good morning pa po ba? Ayan, good morning po. Uh, especially to Miss Pia, good morning. Can you hear me po? Yes po. Ilang sir. Um, hi Miss Pia, with your interaction with your participants po sa study, um, are all your participants offshore accountants po? No. So, um, no, I, I dealt with onshore and offshore accountants, but in my presentation today, the things that I shared with you, you probably noticed that I just focused on offshore accountants because they are virtual workers na from the beginning. Like, that's really the nature of their work. Okay. Po. So, with your offshore accountants participants, po, did they also talk about their, the challenges of the quality of internet that we have here in the Philippines? As you know, um, kahit let's say we pay more for let's say better internet um 
download and upload speed, sometimes it could also be a challenge for them. So did they also talk about the, the quality of internet here in the Philippines? That's an interesting question, uh, Venmar, because actually I, I don't recall that it was really highlighted in their response. I think that's partly because some of these um, offshore accountants, if you recall, um, one of the requirements for the job is to make sure that they have like the right internet speed that they, they can really provide with that kind of um, internet quality, internet connection so that they can sustain the job that they will have to do at home. But also, uh, there's also cases where offshore accountants are doing their work from an office. So I think in that kind of environment, that's also another form of working remotely. And when I say working remotely, it's not remote from the location of the client. So of course, in an office setup, um, they have better facilities for to ensure that the internet connection can sustain the business. Okay. Thank you, Pilia. Do we have other, thank you, Ben Mar. Do we have other questions? Okay. Uh, um, Pia, since some of our participants are also uh, student researchers or graduate students, uh, any, I don't know, probably ideas how they can possibly work on the same area that you're working on or just give them some tips on what the research topics to work on in relation to what you are doing, something like that, something to that effect. Well, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, I, I'm remembering now a conversation, a, just a brief exchange I had with another colleague. I believe she's here, Celine Lena's attorney, Celine. And, and she was saying that, oh, Pia, I'm so interested to listen to your presentation. I think that maybe I can do something similar. And of course, Celine is interested in the legal field. So, um, so taking from that idea of Celine, I think that there are so many occupation groups and so many fields out there. And I think that as language teachers, we have variable opportunities to be exposed to these different domains or occupation groups. Maybe some of you are teaching engineering students or um, maybe you're not even teaching engineering students, but maybe you have lots of engineers in the family, you know, that those kinds of connections or opportunities um, to have some kind of connection to other fields and where we can explore communication practices and ideologies because of course as we know communication is really shaped by context so it would really be interesting to find out for example if the experience of all of these other um, communities of practice or even tayupo as as uh, language practitioners or language teachers how does the how does our experience how does our experience or does our experience work experience um, validate um, these three lessons from from globalized accountants. I guess we can start from that. Mm, okay, that's that's uh, a very good uh, suggestion. Uh huh. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience? Okay, looks like yeah, nagi isip isip pa rin sila. Okay, so um, for our participants, I have already posted the link to uh, the auto generate certificate. Please uh, do accomplish the one very philippine english accomplish the form the online form okay so that you can receive your e certificate so at this point i'd like to call um, a representative from the university of santo tomas okay dr camille visconde to say a few words i'm not so sure if um dr maluma jr is still with us but i'm chatting with camille now uh, to uh, possibly close the um, meeting formally Okay, Dr. Camille Visconde. Hi, Pia. And uh, <laughs> this, this is a surprise. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am surprised. <laughs> well, anyway, I think this is what online communication can do to us. Yeah. We are also in for surprises like this. <laughs> but, uh, Shirley? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. But anyway, sorry. I, I cannot show myself to you because I am not prepared physically for the closing. <laughs> but but anyway, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Pia, for being in with us today and sharing to us your thoughts about uh, what you're doing right now in Macquarie uh, for the information of everyone. Pia was with us for so many years in the University of Santo Tomas and it's always a pleasure to really see where she is right now and how she's been sharing all this knowledge and expertise that she's been uh, 
um, trying to do in, in Macquarie and to listen to her now speak regarding this topic is really such a wonderful experience. So we'd like to thank you, Pia, for, for sharing everything to us today. And of course, we'd like to thank your supervisors for taking, of you ve taking care of you very well in, in Sydney. And uh, that would be Dr. Lee Singh and uh, uh, Dr. Pilar, who have been really, you've been blessed with such wonderful supervisors. Yeah, that's true. So we'd like to, in, in behalf of the University of Santo Tomas and LSP, Dr. Bernardo is here, is there, the president of LSP. Yeah. <laughs> so I think technology is not helping us at this point because um, some of <laughs> some of these um, uh, internet probably or the technology is not helping at, us at this point. But I'd like to thank everyone who is here with us in this session. Uh, maybe as far as uh, other countries are, uh, are here in this session. And we'd like to thank everyone for being with us today. And we look forward to being with you and sharing with you the, the webinars that are to come for LSP and the University of Santo Tomas. So once again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Given the sh a short uh, notice. Okay. Thank you again, Loy. But at this point, please don't leave yet. We will do the usual virtual picture taking. Okay. Oh, While okay. we are doing the usual virtual take uh, picture taking, any uh, words from our deal, Loy? Would you like to say something, Loy? <laughs> okay. I, I, actually, I, I would, if you don't mind, um, the question. Okay. I'm just, I'm uh, the, not going to leave yet because we are going to have the uh, virtual e picture taking before. I mean, after your your uh, of, yes words. Okay. Of course, of course, that would be a pleasure. Uh, maybe just to add to the response Pia gave on your question. Um, in terms of what other ideas for research. Um, that um, others who are in the audience might be thinking about. Um, uh, Ingrid and I, so Ingrid's the main supervisor and I'm the associate supervisor. Uh, we do investigation into multilingualism and multilingual practices. Uh, in particular, Ingrid um, does that investigation through ethnographic research, whereas I do that through ethnographic research and corpus. Um, I think that extending beyond thinking of your social network and what linguistic interests you might want to investigate, um, I think one of the things that uh, Pia has really uh, grown in, matured in, is the approach to investigating language and communication practices through um, ethnography and essentially you can paraphrase ethnography as being on site. So having a nuanced understanding of communication practices, not just in terms of what participants report they use or they feel, but you as a researcher also actually observing that in situ. Um, and so um, perhaps as you some of you are thinking of pursuing research. Uh, think of that as an alternative approach. So in, in some uh, research uh, methodological approach um, is often very limited to the kind of data that you have. So I do corpus research as well. And what I discover is very much limited by the corpus that I have in my hand. Whereas ethnographic research allows you to not only build corpus, but to also uh, go through and go to all these spaces to do the observation that you, you have. And in the end, like you've heard Pia share, you have a very, a very data-driven and empirically based um, approach to understanding complexities of uh, how languages are used in the various spaces that you are in. So um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say Andrew and um, Shirley, um, 
uh, they kindly invited me to do a talk in the future. Yeah, so okay, maybe. I can announce the one as early as now, <laughs> but I'm not going to preempt yet. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> so I've, <laughs> I've tentatively <laughs> said yes, but maybe that's, that's a topic I can, I can further pursue. So I, I hope that, um, yeah, and, and obviously uh, much of, of what inspires you to do research is also what you read. So I've had the good fortune of Pierre reading one of the papers I've written with Ingrid, and that partly also um, motivated her to try and find where I am in Sydney. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, Lo, and we look forward to your talk, okay? Um, I'll announce that one soon, okay, after arranging everything. So at this point, okay, everyone, you might want to switch on your video, although I can't uh, switch mine, okay, for our picture taking. Okay, I'm now on the first uh, screen. We have 10 screens at the moment, some already left, okay? So please uh, flash your best smile. Mary Grace, <laughs> I can see you on the screen. Would you like to, uh, something's covering your face, okay? Mary Grace, kag, 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 something, okay. Uh, smile, where's Pia? Now on the first screen, uh, Andrew is there. Okay, there, there's Pia. Hi, Andrew. Something <laughs> also with your audio, okay? Uh, let's have now the usual picture taking. Let me just close the other screen here. Okay, uh, I am. Okay, already one, two, three, smile. Thank you, next screen now. William, I cannot see. Okay, there you go. Uh, Priscilla, I got to check ako talaga. Hi, Iris, you're there. Priscilla, I cannot see you. Where are you? Okay, smile. One, two, three. Thank you. Third screen na po tayo. Wow, ayan na. Kompleto pa rin sila. Okay, smile. One, two, three. Hi, Dr. Rachel. I saw you. Nandiyan ka pala pinsan. Okay, next. Uh, fourth screen now. Anna May. You there? Irish, 